It's the Labor Day picnic. You've got uh, your friends coming over. It's going to be a great day. You've got the perfect playlist all ready to go, which of course would be 80s songs. We know that. You've got the volleyball net set up. Not, not badminton. What even is badminton? Could you see Eric Bancroft playing badminton? I just, I couldn't even picture it. Maybe you were a professional badminton player at one time. We've got the volleyball net. We've got the playlist. The pool is all ready to go. It is Florida after all. But what is the main ingredient for the Labor Day picnic? It is the grilled hot dog. Now, I have a philosophical question for you. If you have grilled hot dogs, what also must you have? No, not mustard. That is not the philosophical answer. All right, you have notebooks. Write this down. This is a philosophical point. Probably the most profound philosophical point that will be said so far. And it's this. Grilled hot dogs need a hot dog griller. That's the philosophical point. Grilled hot dogs need a hot dog griller. Because everything is an effect. Grilled hot dogs are an effect. And every effect has a cause. Now, this is very important to this question of how can we know God? Because God is the ultimate hot dog griller. He is the ultimate cause. Now, Aristotle, Plato, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, they like to talk about first cause, uncaused cause, unmoved mover, necessary cause. I'm just going to simply talk about the hot dog griller. God is the first cause. God is the cause of all that there is. But how do we know this? There's a very key verse in Acts chapter 14, verse 17. Uh, Paul's in Lystra. This is a city full of Roman pagans. And they've got their mythology. Uh, so much so, they actually think that Paul and Barnabas are manifestations of Greek gods, Zeus and Hermes, come down on earth. These are Roman pagans. And you know what Paul says to them in verse 17? Yet, God has not left Himself without a witness. And that witness is His revelation. That witness is the effects. Now, let's go to the chalkboard. If God is known by... Revelation, we can break this down into two kinds of revelation. There is natural, whoops, I will not do that again, I promise. There is natural and special. Now, in the South, we have two sayings that don't mean what they mean. One is, bless your heart. That actually does not mean that at all. The other one is, you're special. Doesn't mean that either. But in this case, it does mean it. So, natural revelation can be broken down into the world and the self. The self is part of the world, but we as human beings are a special creation. We are, unlike everything else that is created, we are in the image of God. Special revelation is the Bible. And at the center of the Bible, 
And at the center of the revelation of who God is, is Christ. And if we are in the image of God, the Bible teaches us that Christ is the image of God. And how do we know these things? Well, we know the world and ourselves through the senses and through reason. And how do we know this? By faith. So, there's any number of passages we could look at here. Uh, One text is the Acts chapter 14 text I just told you about, Paul at Lystra. Another text is Acts chapter 17, Paul at Athens. So, write these texts down. We're not going to look at them right now, but write them down and sometimes study them, maybe study them together to see what these texts talk about, how God can be known. It's Acts chapter 14, verses 15 to 18 or so. Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 34. Also, that's sort of Paul in in action, like Paul as an example. You also have to look at what Paul teaches in Romans chapter 1, so you can look at verses 18 on down through the end of the chapter of Romans 1. But the text I want to look at with you is Psalm chapter 19, because what Psalm chapter 19 does is bring these two together as the witnesses, the testimony, remember, yet he did not leave himself without a witness. Let's see the language that's used here by the psalmist as we jump into Psalm 19. As you're turning there, Psalm 19 is is nicely divided at verses 1 to 6 and then verses 7 to 14, or actually verses 7 to 13, and then a a concluding prayer at the end in verse 14. And 1 to 6 is about nature and the natural world and the witness of God in nature. And then at verse 7, David turns and gives us the witness of God in Scripture. And so Psalm 19 verse 1 begins, the heavens declare the glory of of God. And the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. So, these aren't audible words. This isn't some special language that we have to tune into. These are metaphors of speech. That They shout the presence of God. In fact, verse 4 continues, their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, He has sent a set, a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. So, we see the sun rise and we watch it go across the sky and then we see the sun set. And that whole journey of the sun is a testimony, a witness to God. Its rising is from end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. You can't escape the witness, the testimony of God. Before we ever pick up a Bible, before we ever hear a biblical verse, we hear the testimony of God in His world. Philosophers will call this the cosmological argument. Now, there's probably an expression you don't use with your friends every day, but the cosmological argument is very important here, and the beginnings understand, the beginnings of the understanding of this question, the answer to this question, how we know God. It's called the cosmological argument because the word for world is cosmos. The cosmos is the effect. The cosmos is the grilled hot dog. And nothing comes from nothing. Something has to come from something. Grilled hot dogs don't just poof into existence. They're made. Well, let's not talk about how hot dogs actually get made. Let's not worry about that detail. Let's leave that nicely out. But we know they get grilled, and they don't grill themselves. 
And so this world that we bump into with our senses, that we know through our senses, that we can make sense of, that we can see order in, we can see the laws of the universe at work. We know every time we drop something, it's going to fall. Every time you drop your water bottles on the brick floor, we're going to hear them this afternoon. Every time you drop something, it falls. That's the law of gravity. Uh, We know the law of non-contradiction that is at work. I can't say it's sunny outside and rainy outside at the same time. A cannot be non-A. This is what makes speech intelligible. This is what allows us to reason together, to have any conversation, let alone a conversation about who God is. And the law of cause and effect is at work in the universe. If you play pool, you know the law of cause and effect. You have to hit it at just that right angle, but when you do, it causes the ball to go in that direction. These laws are at work in the universe. We observe them. We see them every day, and they are a testimony pointing to who God is. The harder explanation is to try to explain the world apart from God. The harder explanation is to try to offer some sort of sensical reason for the existence of this world apart from a God at the beginning of the universe and at the beginning of all things. God left us with a witness. And we can use this world for our own reasons to know there is a God, but we can also use this world to help our friends think about, where did all this come from? Where did I come from? And it all points us back to God. And then at verse 7, we turn to the Bible. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. All of those are synonymous, law, testimony, precepts, commandments. All of those are telling us that God has given us the gift of His Word so that we can know who He is. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and dripping off the honeycomb. I don't know if you've ever had honey straight out of the hive dripping off the honeycomb, but there is nothing else like it. God's Word is sweeter still. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. It is God's Word that teaches us how to live holy righteous lives before Him. So, we start with the knowledge of God from the natural world, the knowledge of God as Creator. And as Creator, that means we are created. And as created, that means we are accountable. When you go to Acts chapter 17 and you look at that, and Paul tells these Athenians, This is the capital of the Greco-Roman philosophical world. Athens was the home of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And Paul stands up there, the same spot where Socrates stood to give his apology. Paul starts with the same three words, men of Athens, that were uttered 400 plus years earlier, and he makes his case for the existence of God in the gift of of this natural world. And then Paul says, and He is judge. Knowledge of God as Creator, outside of knowing God in Christ, is the knowledge of God as judge. Outside of Christ, 
our relationship to God is as enemy. We are His enemies outside of Christ. But when we know God in Christ, who is the image of God, who came to manifest His glory, that's what Christ came to do, to make God's glory known. He is the crystal clear revelation of who God is, the incarnate God-man, Jesus Christ. And in Christ, we come to know God as Father. And as we study Scripture, just as we study the world and we see the world as revelatory of God, and this was, you see this all through church history, this was Jonathan Edwards who loved to go on horseback rides to see the beauty of God and nature just as the psalmist declares it. He would even see the beauty of God in thunderstorms. If only he lived in central Florida, he'd have one every day. We study nature to see God and His marvelous work. So, how do we know God? By His revelation, by His revelation in the Word. So, we roll up our sleeves and we study His Word to know who God is. And as we study God's Word, what do we learn? We learn that He is just and true and righteous. We learn that He is omnipotent omnipresent and omniscient. That means that God is all-powerful, that God is all-knowing, that God is all-present. And if you want a really big syllable word today, here it is, omnibenevolence. God is all good. He's full of mercy and love and kindness. and He's pure, and He's glorious, and He's holy. Do you know the best thing you can do in life? And the the best thing you can help your friends to do is to know this, to know who God is. When they find out you're a Christian, or if you want to engage with your friends as a Christian and, and share your faith and share your testimony, very often what happens is all sorts of questions pop up. And, and especially sometimes it pops up, we get Christianity connected to a certain political viewpoint, or we get Christianity connected to some certain news item that's going on. And so you talk about Christianity, and all of a sudden your friend just wants to go at that. Or sometimes they have really legitimate questions that are raised, Uh, questions of, of suffering or questions of not seeing beauty in the world and not seeing order in the world, but seeing things that are more chaotic and not seeing things that always make sense, but sometimes things that are senseless. So you get all sorts of questions. You get sort of smokescreen questions. You get legitimate questions. Do you know, though, what all of those questions are ultimately leading up to and building up to and pointing to? And the question you have to constantly keep in front of them is who God is. That's the question. And so the best thing you can do is for you to pursue the answer to that question, to know who God is. Not the God that we want, not the God of our making but the God who is. And the very best thing you can do for your friends is to help them know this God too. Pray with me. Father God, we thank You for Your revelation. We thank You for the clarity of Your revelation in this world. We thank You for the clarity of Your revelation in the face of Your dear Son. We thank You that You have not left us without a witness, but that You have indeed left us with a witness. May we devote our lives to knowing who You are and to proclaiming who You are 
to a world around us in such desperate need. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.